Hi, everyone. My name is Scott Holstein. I'm the Director of Marketing and Business Development for CompuTrolls. Thank you all for attending our webinar today. As you probably know, CompuTrolls is a manufacturer of building automation systems. You'll primarily see our technology in commercial real estate, hospitals, data centers, and higher education facilities. Some of our prominent customers around the country include the Statue of Liberty, Williams Tower, Chase Tower, Harris Hotel and Casino, and the Mercedes-Benz Superdome. In addition to our headquarters just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana, CompuTrolls also has branch also has branch offices in Southern California, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, and Washington, D.C. We also support our customers both domestically and internationally through our service and distribution partner network. And we're always looking for new distribution partners, so if you're ever interested in learning more about CompuTrolls uh, and, and how you can work with us, um, please fill out a form on our website, email us at info at CompuTrolls.com. We'll also have some contact information for you at the end of this presentation. Um, so since the company began 35 years ago, it's always been CompuTrol's mission to empower our customers to manage their own building automation system. One of the ways that we do that is through providing the most intuitive building automation interface on the market. You'll get a glance at this today, uh, again, as we walk you through some of these cooling tower program, uh, some of this cooling tower programming. But uh, if you'd like to see more, please feel free to contact us. Uh, we're going to do our best to get through all of this in 20 or 30 minutes or so and leave some time for questions at the end. If you have a question, simply click the comment bubble at the top of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Those questions not answered will be answered today or tomorrow by email. Also, we will be providing a recording of this webinar, so uh, feel free to you know uh, take notes where you feel necessary, but there will be a recording, so um, taking screenshots and, and taking notes are optional. Uh, our presenter today is CompuTrol's Director of Research and Development, Mike Dolan, but don't be fooled by his title. Mike has, spent more, more, Mike has spent more time in the field than most technicians, which is one of the driving forces behind why CompuTrol continues to create some of the most innovative and intuitive products on the market. Mike joined CompuTrol in 1989 when he created the very first version of CompuTrol's building automation software, better known as CBAS. And today, Mike actively selects the hardware and software platforms, development tools, and technologies used in CompuTrol's products. So with that introduction, Mike, please take it away. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about cooling tower control based on approach. Uh, this is something that uh, we've been doing in all of our buildings for a good while now, and every time we talk about it with clients, they're very interested. So this is a, a webinar that uh, we've gotten a lot of interest in, and we're really looking forward to, uh, to trying to get everybody educated, see if we can't save some energy. Um, the uh, the presentation is basically in three parts. First section is humidity theory. Now this is something that um, everybody knows about humidity, but it turns out humidity is quite complicated. And today I'm gonna actually spend a good bit, bit uh, more time on humidity theory than I had in earlier presentations. Um, the next thing, once we get the humidity stuff out of the way, we're gonna talk about cooling towers, a little bit how they work and what this thing is uh, that we call approach. A lot of mechanical engineers, uh, design engineers will know this very well. Uh, many people in the controls uh, side of things may not uh, know about it. And then finally at the end, we're gonna look at CBAS and how we use CBAS to um, control the cooling towers based on this new approach. Uh, today, I'm going to actually stress a lot more in the humidity underlying theory. On our website is an article that I wrote a while back. Uh, you can look it up at compitrolls.com under cooling tower approach. And it is a very concise article that lays out exactly what you need, but it doesn't go a lot into the background. So I'm going to cover a lot of background information today and see if I can't complement that article a little bit. Uh, with the way I do things today. So let's start off now with the uh, humidity theory. And just just a heads up, um, humidity theory, and one of the things that I've really been uh, excited about for our own technicians and clients and people we work with, our distribution partners, is getting some of this stuff out of the way. Yes, it's theory, it can be boring, but there are a lot of applications that require a really good feeling for humidity. So today, you look at the bottom, we're doing cooling tower programming but also optimum start. Um, optimum start to do it well requires uh, humidity calculations. That Monday morning early start 
uh, mostly has to do with latent heat. You have to remove humidity and cool, whereas in the other days you just cool. Enthalpy control, this is a fancy word for if it's really nice outside, blow in a lot of fresh air. And humidity control itself, just straight up controlling humidity in medical facilities and all that really require tight humidity control. So all of these uh, different types of control strategies are based on humidity theory and having a good fundamental, fundamental grasp of it um, will really help you do that. But today we're, we're going to stick to our cooling tower programming at the end here. Um, so humidity theory, there are all these numbers. We show temperature, uh, dry bulb, wet bulb, relative humidity, absolute humidity, dew point, enthalpy, all kinds of uh, different numbers that are just different ways of describing the same thing. Basically, we start with air and water vapor in it, and we can use a lot of these different metrics to uh, get a further description. Um, so two key humidity concepts that I'm going to go over today. The first one is the maximum humidity in air depends on its temperature. Um, so humidity would be simple if we would just take a volume of air and evaporate water vapor into it, and it would become saturated, and that would be it. That would be quite easy to calculate, describe, and get a feel for. But what happens is the air can hold different amounts of water at different temperatures. That's what makes it complicated. So we really have to get a feel for that. The second concept is when water vapor, when water vapor evaporates from water, the water that's left behind is cooled. Uh, we call this evaporative cooling. Um, this is the, the theory of how cooling towers work. And many other things work on evaporative cooling as well. So we want to make sure that we, you get a good grasp of both of those concepts before you roll up your sleeves and start doing logic on cooling towers. Um, so let's start with that first one, uh, humidity versus temperature. So in all of the examples today, we're going to be working at atmospheric pressure. Um, the equations that um, govern humidity are complicated enough, and you, they do depend on pressure, but typically air pressure around atmosphere has no effect on it. So we're always going to see that one atmosphere. You can just sort of ignore it from that point forward. Uh, relative humidity, um, we're going to, in this example, keep at 100%. We call that saturation. It's 100% relative humidity, which means the air cannot take any more water vapor. It is completely saturated. So I like to use this little bucket example. Um, here we have a bucket, and we've written absolute humidity. That's absolute, not relative. It's how much water is in the air. And we've got 21.6 grams per meter cubed. That's at 75 degrees. If I go outside and it's 75 degrees, a cubic meter of air can hold 21.6 grams of water. Now let's look at warmer air. We, we warm that air up to 85 degrees. Well, guess what? That same cubic meter of air can now hold 29.4 grams per uh, cubic meter. So just a 10 degree increase in the temperature of the air, it can hold a lot more water. Um, so this concept of air holding different amounts of water vapor really makes humidity complicated. Um, so saturation increases with temperature. Um, let's look at a little different way of dealing with it. So now we're going to keep the absolute humidity constant. So back to our bucket of water, 75 degrees, and we have 17 grams per cubic meter of water in that air. That's 80% humidity. We're 80% of the way of saturating that air. Now let's warm that air up and this time, we won't actually let any more water get into it. So at 85 degrees, we have the exact same amount of water in the air, but our relative humidity went down. Um, so in cool air, that 17 grams of water uh, constituted 80% relative humidity. At warmer air, it drops down to 58%. Now, this is counterintuitive. You say, wait, the humidity goes down, but it's the same amount of water. 
Yes, the absolute humidity is the same in both cases. The relative humidity, that is relative to how much that air could hold, actually drops because warmer air can hold more. So relative humidity changes with constant levels of water vapor. Again, this concept is a bit confusing, so we want to make sure everybody has that before we move on. So um, relative humidity, summarizing the relationship between it and comfort is well understood. So, you know, why do we even use the term relative humidity? Why don't we just deal in absolute humidity? Wouldn't it make our life easier? Well, if someone came to you and said, hey, is it comfortable inside? And you said, well, there's 17 grams of water per cubic meter. You'd say, well, I don't really know what that means. Is that is that comfortable? Is it is it sticky? Is it is it dry? Um, so relative humidity is used because everyone understands at any temperature that 90% humidity is uncomfortable and 50% humidity is comfortable. Um, the relationship between relative humidity and energy is poorly understood, and that's a lot of what these lectures based on humidity are all about. Um, calculating, you know, how much energy you use, for example, to dehumidify air, or how much energy is gained by evaporating um, water vapor from air, that's poorly understood. Um, that's not why we use relative humidity. Um, so, and it's mainly confusing because of the concept that we just covered. So, um, now we're going to look at evaporative cooling. So, we take our bucket of water back outside and we have dry air. Eventually, that bucket of water starts to evaporate. The remaining water that's left behind after evaporation is cooler. That's because it takes energy to sort of kick those water molecules out. And that energy comes from the heat inside the water. So when the water evaporates, the remaining water is cooler. Um, let's take a good example of evaporative cooling. I call it the human HVAC system. That's right, your body has its own built-in control system. It likes to be at a particular temperature. And we have a built-in HVAC system to help us do that. So when it's warm outside, we perspire. Our body becomes wet, and that's shown by the little blue lines around our guy here. And ultimately, that perspiration, if it's dry outside, it evaporates. When it evaporates, it leaves the water that's remaining on your body um, cooler. And this is how we um, cool our body. We get wet, the water evaporates, and through evaporative cooling, we, we feel better. Uh, you can imagine if you, it's a summer day and you're in a swimming pool and you get out of the swimming pool and you're completely covered in water, you feel much cooler than if you didn't have that water on you. It's not because the water's cold. It's because the water's evaporating. If you were wet and stood in front of a fan, you'd even feel much cooler. On a hot day, you might even be cold standing in front of a fan wet. So our bodies um, use this evaporative cooling to run efficiently. Um, let's take a, uh, an example here where it's humid outside. Um, now we have our guy, he's outside. It's both warm and humid. So the warmth, our body uh, perspires and emits moisture. It's on our skin. Uh, the problem here is that since it's humid, let's just say it were almost 100% humid outside, that water's not going to evaporate. So our human HVAC system doesn't really function well. Our evaporative cooling is not working well. Um, humid air makes us uncomfortable because our body's ability to cool down has been compromised by humid air. Um, Let's look at cooling towers and how they work um, based on this evaporative cooling. So I think everybody in the controls industry is familiar with this. We have condenser water coming from the chiller, technically coming from the condenser, but the both of them, and it, and it is sent up to the roof or wherever your uh, tower fans are, and the water is put through a series of fins and meshes and so on and so forth, and it goes back to the chiller cooler. 
when I first started doing this right out of college, I used to think, oh, it's because the air cools it. There is some temperature cooling, but it's mostly the evaporative cooling that we talked about. So the water evaporates, and the water that remains and goes back to the chiller, as we stated, is at a lower temperature because of the evaporation. We get some cooling with no fan at all. But just like on that summer day, if you were wet and came out of the pool and you stand in front of a fan, it promotes evaporation. And so if we turn our fan on, um, we actually get more cooling. And if we turn the fan even more, we get even more cooling. So modern towers usually have VFDs on them, so we get a continuous amount of cooling. Um, max evaporation with fan on high. So fan energy produces evaporative cooling. The more energy we spend on fan, the more evaporation we get and we'll, the more cooling we'll get. Um, <clears throat> here we show the fan running and we're gonna take an example with some actual numbers in it. So um, <clears throat> let's just say we had 95 degree water coming from the chiller and outside it was hot on a moderately dry day, 50% relative humidity, um, we can calculate that the wet bulb temperature is 75 degrees. Now, wet bulb, for those of you who don't know, um, typically when you say temperature, you're talking about dry bulb. You simply take a temperature sensor and you stick it out in the air and it measures the temperature. A wet bulb would be if you wrapped a wet cloth around that temperature sensor and it would experience evaporative cooling. That wet cloth, the, uh, the evaporation would cause evaporative cooling. So wet bulb is always less than dry bulb. It's the temperature plus the evaporative cooling. So in, in cooling tower programming, wet bulb is the number that we really want to focus on. Um, it, is the, it is the humidity description that best uh, relates to what we're trying to do here. So these numbers are easy. Let me uh, uh, quickly show you a uh, one of my favorite calculators that I just came across um, on the internet. Let's get it on the screen here. It's by a company called Mitchell Instruments. I don't know these guys, but they have uh, one of the coolest calculators here. So what I like about it is you can know anything and from that calculate anything. So here we have relative humidity. Uh, let's just say I'll put it at 50% um, pressure. We sort of defaults to atmosphere. And the sample temperature is 90 degrees, and I say calculate. And all these numbers come up, and down here you see wet bulb 75 degrees. That's where I got that. Um, I, uh, I got this 75 degrees right here from that calculator. So given the dry bulb, the relative humidity, we get our wet bulb. Um, so now we want to try to figure out um, what can we do the best we can do to reach our set point. So here it says a set point for our chillers is 83 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we could spend an entire webinar deciding what that number should be. And building engineers are usually quite familiar at uh, what uh, they want the temperature of the condenser water going back to the chiller to be. Uh, newer chillers can take actually very low temperatures, and, and they're quite efficient when you do that. But 83 degrees is a common number that you would see as a temperature set point. What we're saying is we want to send 83-degree water back to the chillers. So can we do it? Um, approach, in which you'll see some graphs and all later, right now we're just saying is seven degrees. We can get seven degrees away from wet bulb temperature. So a wet bulb is 75. Seven degrees away from that is 82. Yes, we can make 83 degree water. We could make it 82 and we'd be right at the limit of what this tower fan can do. So that's the concept of approach, is that given your outside air conditions, you actually calculate um, what you can do condenser water-wise back to the chillers. And as you'll see later, the main point of this is that if you can't reach your set point, stop trying because you're just wasting fan energy. And we'll see that later. 
Um, so there's no problem here achieving set point. Let's take a, uh, a different example. All we've done here to change the numbers is we went up to 75% relative humidity. So same deal, we're, we're uh, 90 degrees outside, except instead of it being 50% relative humidity, we're going to take 75% relative humidity. What does that do? It raises our wet bulb temperature to 83 degrees. Now, we want 83 degrees, so we, you should already know we're kind of in trouble here. So, again, you take your 83-degree wet bulb, you add a 7-degree approach. That's the best that the towers can do. And the minimum condensed water temperature you can produce is 90 degrees. So you cannot give the chiller what it wants. You cannot give the chiller 83 degrees. Why? Because it's hot and humid outside, and there's a limit to what your tower fans are going to do. And any fan energy you put into dropping the temperature below 90 degrees is simply not going to work. Um, you can add more fan, and you can add even more fan. It's not going to, it's not going to go below 90 degrees. Um, so that's the situation that we're trying to calculate and avoid. Um, just, for, just for fun, let's just go ahead and say that the relative humidity is 100% outside. Now, that is unrealistic that you would it would be 90 degrees and 100% humidity, unless, of course, you live in New Orleans like we do. Uh, that, actually, 100% uh, is, for reasons I won't get into, is hard to reach during the hottest part of the day. Um, so it's unrealistic, but I do it really just as an exercise because one of the things that you'll notice is that the wet bulb temperature is equal to the dry bulb temperature. What you're saying is at 100% humidity, no evaporative cooling can take place, right? The air can't take any more water. It's at 100%. It's completely saturated. So you can take a temperature sensor that's dry, or you can take a temperature sensor and put a wet cloth on top of it. The, the temperature is the same. So, of course, we add a 7-degree approach. And basically, at this point, you're just going to get condensed water that's, at best case scenario, equal to the outside air temperature. So, Obviously, when it's when it's 100% humidity outside, you you have no evaporative cooling. Um, so, just summarizing here, wet bulb temperature is the temperature read by a thermometer covered in water soaked cloth over which air is passed. Um, to be clear, and we'll go over this in a minute. Uh, normally, you don't buy a wet bulb uh, sensor; you you calculate it. Um, at 100% relative humidity, the wet bulb temperature is equal to the dry bulb temperature. We covered that. They're equal because there's no evaporative cooling that the wet bulb can benefit from. Um, and wet bulb can be calculated from other variables using charts or a computer. Um, so over on the right, we start to get into cooling tower efficiency. And those of you might be having nightmares from high school algebra at this point. Um, you can calculate, we, we, in the prior examples, we had been using a seven degree approach. That's just a rule of thumb number that when in doubt, throw in seven degrees, that's very, very typical. But well-designed cooling towers uh, can do better than that, and poorly designed cooling towers uh, don't do that well. I say designed, maintained, all of it. Uh, there's different performance of cooling towers. Um, calculating it, you'd have to be uh, quite good at it to try and calculate it. Uh, the good news is uh, you don't have to. Um, in CBAS, one of the things that we've been doing since early versions of our software is we save historical data on every point all the time. There's not you don't start a trend or whatever. So the condenser water temperatures, both going into and coming out, the outside air temperatures, the fan status, all of it is being saved. Um, you can simply look back through the history and you can determine um, how your cooling towers perform. Um, and we'll get into that in just a second. I, I did want to just cover this, you know, Mechanical engineers have seen this before. They call it the psychrometric chart. Even the name of it is complicated. Uh, the main part that I wanted to go over is how hard some of these numbers are to calculate. Um, the relationships are nonlinear. And for those of you who 
are not quite familiar with that term. Us computer math nerds are quite familiar with the term. A simple equation like you learned in high school, like y equals mx plus b, would be the equation of a straight line. You can calculate it with the pen and paper. If you were to chart it, it would be a straight line, and therefore it's linear. Uh, you can see from this uh, chart that they're not linear. There's these big red swooshing lines and all. They're not very easy to calculate. So all of these numbers that we talk about when relating to air's temperature and humidity are on this chart. So we have the humidity ratio in purple. That's similar to um, absolute humidity. We have dry bulb. When you're just talking about dry bulb, that's the green uh, vertical lines. Uh, wet bulb, that's the blue line. And although it's linear, you can see a straight line. You can see that the slope of that line changes as you go up. Um, relative humidity is red. That's the really swooshy nonlinear one. Um, we also have enthalpy, which is a great number for certain applications. We're not going to talk about it today. Um, specific volume, so on and so forth. So calculating all the numbers relating to humidity is not easy. Um, so that's why in CBAS we, we do that for you. Um, Compatrol CBAS, we have this English language logic editor. Uh, when I started this presentation, I thought I'll do all the logic for a cooling tower. Uh, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it can get quite lengthy. You could have pages of uh, lead lag logic and, you know, fan starts and fan failures, and there, you could get quite complicated. And we really want to save that type of programming for a sequencing um, type of webinar or, or a learning session. Today we're really just trying to get this concept down. But while you're in there and you're doing your cooling tower logic, there are some equations uh, or some calculations we can do for you. Um, so dew point um, is one of them. Um, and you can see basically you calculate dew point given dry bulb and percent RH. Most of the humidity calculations we do for you take those two numbers dry bulb and relative humidity. That's because that's the types of sensors that most people have purchased and installed. So if you have a temperature sensor and you have a humidity sensor, you can calculate dew point. Um, we can go over what dew point means. I think a lot of you uh, know what that means. Uh, dry bulb, we can flip that around. We can calculate dry bulb given dew point and percent RH. And in some of the other lectures I'm going to do, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why you would want to do that. Um, and enthalpy, another great uh, humidity number that can be used in a lot of situations. And finally, wet bulb. That's the guy we're looking for. Uh, we can calculate wet bulb uh, given dry bulb and percent relative humidity. So as we spoke before, you're going to want wet bulb uh, to calculate your best condenser water return temperature that you can achieve given approach. Um, so how do we go about getting that approach number? I've been just plugging in seven in all the examples, um, but uh, let's let's look at it on a chart and hopefully the, uh, the chart doesn't uh, confuse anybody, but here we have um, condenser water temperature to the chillers in green. So our axis over here, it starts at 92 and it goes down, and I'll, I'll cover that. We've got uh, percent speed all fans in sort of an orange here, um, and we have high wet bulb day. So <clears throat> a lot of the things we're doing now in our, in, in our upcoming software, we do a lot of machine learning, we find it easier to simply run systems in a way that may not be optimum and collect tons of data and then just go back and look at the data and produce the model from that. It's much easier to just play with it, see how it works, and then decide how we want to change that behavior than it is to try and calculate it from scratch. And that's what we're doing here. We, we want you to use CBAS um, as a tool to graph, just like we do an optimum start when you start a fan you see how fast the temperature drops before it reaches set point, and you plug in one little number. Don't calculate that number. Just play with the equipment and see what it can do. So this big green arrow here, that's the uh, what we've been calling the approach. It's the difference between the condenser water temperature and the wet bulb.
So what you want to do is you want to wait for there to be a high wet bulb day. You actually want to try to take the coolant tower fans above what they can do. That's why we want to wait for a high day. We don't want to actually meet the condenser water temperature. We want to push the fans beyond uh, that limit of what they can actually do. So the way we, we do it here, we start with, and the orange axis is a little confusing is over here, we start with our fans running about 50%. So we're going to kind of go on the left-hand side here, and we're going to move to the right. So at 50% fan, this is all fans running on VFDs, we're running them at 50% of their speed. We have a condenser water temperature, return temperature to the chillers of 92. So obviously when we give it more fan, we're going to produce more evaporative cooling, that temperature drops. And you can see it drops here to about 91. And we keep going, and somewhere around 75% fan, we hit this dotted line. This dotted line is the line that the condenser water approaches but can never, ever pass. And that, I think that's where the name come, comes from, approach. So at around 75% fan, we've achieved all of the evaporative cooling we're going to get. If you continue to let the fans ramp up, and here we show it going all the way to 100, we're just not going to get anything for it. We'd be better off stopping at 75%. The problem is, the first time we do this, we don't know that, in this case, you can see from 80 to around 87. It is indeed around a 7-degree approach right here. We don't know when we start doing this that 7 degrees is a magic number. It might be 6 degrees. It might be 8 degrees. But you should take a high wet bulb day, run your fans up to full speed, and just see how close you can get your condenser water temperature down to your uh, wet bulb. Um, and once you do that, then you go back into your logic and you plug that number in. So you use CBAS history to determine your uh, best approach, which uh, would be seven degrees. It could be um, that you have an eight degree is the best approach you can get, or a six degree is the best approach you can get. In this case, it's seven degrees. and if you, I like to, when I'm programming cooling towers, I like to get them down to just a single PID loop. That is, it, hopefully most of you are familiar with um, PID control loops. Um, it basically takes three numbers, the output, in this case the fan speed, the set point, where I want my condenser water temperature to be, and the feedback where the condenser water temperature actually is. So you just move the output until the input meets set point. So in the case uh, of a high wet bulb day, you can't actually reach set point, and that's uh, kind of the point here. So you just graph your variables, as I have done here, and you just over speed the fans, even though you're not getting any more cooling, just to make sure you know that that approach is seven degrees. So you do it experimentally, you look at your history, and then you type that in. When you're done, you have a PID loop running, and there's just some logic that says, okay, 83 degrees is the uh, condenser water temperature I want, that's my set point, but if the calculated best condensed water temperature I can do is above that, just raise that set point to that calculated number. That way, you will not run your fans higher than their usefulness is. So in the case here, once again, if we had that logic and we had, let's say, an 83-degree uh, set point here, our fans would get up to around 75% and then they would just flatline. So rather than running the fans at 100% all day, we would run them at 75% all day and we'd get the exact same condensed water temperature return to our chillers. That, over time, is a very significant savings in energy. So that is basically the point to it. And Again, rather than go through all the logic, because every chiller, um, chiller cooling tower installation is different, the logic varies. If you understand the concepts 
that underlie that logic, you'll be able to do this. So just summarizing, calculate wet bulb. Experimentally figure out your best approach. If you don't want to go through that trouble, just use seven. That'll, that'll be pretty close in most cases. Set your condenser water set point uh, to where you want it to be. And simply, if that best calculated condenser water temperature is above it, just raise your set point to that number. And the PID, will, PID loop will follow that, and it will not overrun your fans, uh, knowing that it can't actually reach it. So um, best to use a PID loop to control all fans. Use a condensed water temperature set point that is best for your chillers. Calculate the minimum achievable condensed water temperature. Reset your set point accordingly. And that basically is tower fan controls uh, based on approach. Um, here we have an email address uh, for any information. Of course, our phone and the related article is mentioned here um, that is much more concise, doesn't go into a lot of the theory, but just gives you the exact uh, logic statements and so on and so forth that you can use. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, we really appreciate it. Very educational, really good information. Um, as Mike mentioned, uh, we have a lot of really good information on our website as well. If you go to chompytrolls.com and then go to our news and events section, you'll find a lot of educational articles. Also recommend signing up for our newsletter um, to, uh, to kind of keep up with the latest and greatest information we have coming out, uh, keep you know the information for our next webinar. Uh, and we appreciate you all joining us today. As I mentioned, a recording of this will be sent out shortly, and uh, we hope to see you all at our next webinar. Thank you.